Racer and Eric, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to have you guys here. Hi, and Richard here as well. Good to, good to hear you and see you, actually. We're seeing you, but uh, everybody else is hearing you. It's great. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. We're so happy to talk with you today. And we're spread out all over the place. Yeah. Uh, I, I was thinking that you two would be very conveniently in Illinois, but no. Uh, Eric, uh, now where are you coming from, Eric? You're in? Yeah, I'm going to call it Parkersburg, West Virginia. Fantastic. And Raisa, where, where are you in? I am in Boise, Idaho. Boise. Boise. I tell you, that's a famous <laughs> place. And uh, I, I'm, I'm in Sydney, Sydney, Australia. And, and Matt, where are you? I'm in Brisbane. Well, uh, Logan City, but I always say Brisbane because no one knows what Logan City is or where that is. So, Yeah, well, <laughs> Eric's in some weird place in West Virginia. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it's really great to have you. I mean, uh, uh, we've been doing things for a little while and uh, I've done a talk with you. So it's, it's a high time you, you uh, sent back the, the, the opportunity to us. Uh, but it's, of course, uh, prompted by a fantastic new book, which has just just come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, Matt, we've been pretty excited to see this this idea and this theme coming up, haven't we? Absolutely. I mean, this is a book that I should have written, but these guys have jumped in ahead of me. So I, I'm a little bit jealous, but I'm also extremely stoked that this is a, an amazing resource for all of our our people. This is this is for our people. The Neuroeducation Toolbox. Now, Eric, can you, uh, or, or Raisa, depending on who knows more, the, just give us a bit of, you know, what, what uh, brought this up? What are some of the things? I mean, how did you pull some of these authors? There's a whole bunch of stuff. If you just rattle on, then Matt and I'll just sort of jump in when hopefully uh, uh, with, you know, the, the questions that come up in our minds. Yeah, Eric, do you want to go first? Do you want me to? Well, what are your thoughts? Well, well, yeah, I'll jump in and just talk about how wonderful Raisa is and how her initial conceptualization has just kind of bloomed and kept growing and kept growing. And, you know, we were talking earlier about how our ideas evolve over time. And Raisa wrote an article in the Journal of Mental Health Counseling about this idea of neuroeducation, which is kind of a, a brand of psychoeducation focused on the brain and focused on neuroscience. So, she wrote a wonderful article, and after I heard so many people talking about this article for so long, and Raisa and I had been friends and colleagues for a while, you know, it was kind of like, what's next? And I was like, Raisa, how about a book? How about a book? How about a book? And Raisa, you can uh, share how you reacted. Oh, well, I think I was like, no, I can't write a, a book. Are you crazy? <laughs> um, but Eric is always the visionary and a, such a trusted writing and uh, research partner that I was like, okay, fine, why not? Let's write a book. Um, but really, it's not just our book. You know, as, as readers will be able to see, there are actually, I think at last count, 53, not counting us, um, individual contributors to the text. And some of them have co-authored activities together and others individually. There's 40 total activities um, of different counselors applying this idea of neuroeducation with clients, uh, with children, adults, uh, you know, groups and individuals. I mean, there's just so, so many different kinds of representation of neuroeducation. And so, yes, it is, you know, a, a book that we conceptualized in the beginning, but it really is a book that brings together uh, the wisdom of many, many clinicians across the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to say, I, I, I um, put my hand up uh, when I uh, asked immediately, would you like to write a chapter? And, uh, and I'm absolutely stoked to, to have in there and talking about curiosity and all these things that, that Matt and I talk about so much. So, uh, um, and in, in fact, I'd, I'd, I was almost, I, I remember wondering, I wonder when that thing's, that thing, that thing is coming out and, and then it, it's come out. Now you, you're doing it with, yeah. who's, the, who's the publisher for this one? Cognala. Fantastic. And so very much as an educational book, but I think it's, it's actually, uh, it's something that extends beyond uh, just the educational, which, which is what you're bringing out. There's, there's all these people mm -hmm. talking about how this is applied 
And I think that's mm -hmm. so important. Mm -hmm. But before we go into the application, can we just, in the introduction, you talk a little bit about the philosophical basis of, you know, why neuroeducation. So can you give our listeners a little bit of background as to why this is important? Well, maybe I can share a little bit, Eric, with um, kind of the, the way that I've used it over time. And then you can talk a little bit about the process, because I do think those are unique elements that each of us has brought. Um, you know, Eric mentioned that I originally wrote that article in 2016, but as you can imagine, even my ideas have really evolved through collaborations and over time as I've developed as a clinician. And so initially it was just, I was learning about the brain. Um, this idea of neuroeducation is often referred to in different ways, like brain talk or Dan Siegel, who I know is a friend of of, uh, of our listeners likely in the podcast, is talked about it as internal education. Um, or psycho uh, neuroscience informed psychoeducation. So there's a lot of different ways that this this idea has been referenced in the literature and in, and in trainings. Um, but when I 10, 15 years ago now started first learning about the brain, reading Bonnie Badenoch's book, actually, The Brain Wise Therapist, I thought this is this makes so much sense. You know, the the clients I'm seeing, the struggles they're having, um, knowing this information changes the way I'm seeing what their experiences are. It's helping me gain more empathy for them. It's helping me um, really be able to kind of see their story in a different way and think about the ways that I need to intervene with them. And I am just one by nature that if I get excited about information and it's making sense to me that somehow to sometimes the fault of my own need to let other people know this as well, right? Because <laughs> if I appreciate it so much, surely they will too. Um, and so I just started fumbling through trying to explain some basic components of the brain with clients talking about, you know, in the early days, it was like talking about the hand model of the brain or saying, hey, do you know there's this thing called implicit memory versus explicit memory? Um, you know, and, and then I would see clients' eyes light up and be like, oh, that's why I do this thing, or that helps me understand this. And so even though those initial uh, efforts were rudimentary and um, not always probably as effective as they could have been because it was more me telling them about the brain or this cool thing I learned. Um, so it wasn't necessarily as, as um, experiential as I intend and try to be now. It still helped clients gain more curiosity about themselves in their presentations and session. And it helped them often develop a little self-compassion for themselves to be able to, to rewrite their own story in a different way that opened up room for change. So I just was really enthused by those initial responses from many of the clients I worked with. And so from that, really wanting to develop um, not necessarily a philosophy, but at least a, a formalized intervention or a group of interventions around this idea. So that's kind of the longer story background and a little bit of the philosophy, but Eric, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about maybe, you know, discount everything I just said about what I first did. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you know, I really connected, Risa, to what you're saying about, you know, this, we all get excited and, and some people have written about neuro enchantment, you know, so, and, and the seductive allure of neuroscience is kind of a, a cautionary tale to just haphazard integration of neuroscience into practice. And, you know, that's something that we really wanted to advocate for with this work is it's not just telling people what's going on in their brain. It's not just this overly reductionistic explanation. It's actually an exploration of other potential theories about how people can come to understand their past, their present and their future. So when we started building the neuroeducation process, the neuroeducation model, we really, I, I think, built a lot of our ideas on the work of Bruce Wampold and people that have advocated for common factors approaches. And we looked at their contextual model and kind of how that talks about pathways of change being the real relationship into expectations, into specific interventions. And we thought that made a lot of sense in terms of what we were hoping to bring through the neuroeducation process. 
So when we talk about the neuroeducation process, it's it's grounded in everything we do as counselors and psychotherapists as we build the initial relationship and we build on a lot of the work of interpersonal synchronicity and brain coupling and, and work like Alan Shore and people that have talked about the right brain or the right hemisphere, right hemisphere connection, things like that. And out of that comes this real relationship. Out of that comes an unearthing of the way that clients see themselves. And then the neuroeducation comes in as just another potential way to look at that experience. Rasa said, it changes the way that I look at people. And I think our experience would say that it just gives clients another opportunity to look at themselves through a different lens. And through that, help them facilitate a process of making meaning. So some people would criticize that neuroeducation is just telling people stuff, and we would say it's much different than that. It's facilitating a meaning-making process using neuroscience as a thread and a lens to weave in that process. Yes, it's this, it's this thing of, the, uh, of information as, uh, as separate from instruction, and, uh, uh, and this is beautifully informative. Uh, but, it, but it is interesting. I, I was actually doing a, a webinar yesterday with some friends of mine uh, in, uh, to do with uh, mental health in higher education. So it's uh, one of our universities in, in Queensland. And uh, uh, one of the members there, he knows me reasonably well because I, I, we've keynoted together before, but I was talking, I finished my talk and he said, yeah, it's so surprising to see a psychotherapist who's speaking from the framework of the brain and actually able to describe them accordingly. And I went, oh, you know, good me. But it is strange that we have this idea. Now, uh, my wife's a remedial massage therapist, as well as a nurse and a whole bunch of other amazing things. But uh, she can tell you what all the muscles are all about. And and uh, But even still, I mean, I'm in a great uh, racing car driver. I mean, you know, you say, what about the engine? She says, oh, I don't know about that, but uh, drives really well. You know, I mean, this strange idea that we don't need to have any understanding now I understand the people who are worried about the fact that we get we, we get misinformed. I, I, I get that mm -hmm. because everything keeps changing. But this strange idea that we don't need to understand the mechanisms within, which of course Dan, uh, with, uh, uh, Dan is talking about Dan Siegel, these things within, and this has been the great uh, uh, the great battle. And this book is a I think a beautiful, as different from a a pointed. It's a beautiful. Uh, intrusion into this um, problem that psychotherapists have with knowledge. What have what you found with your people? Yeah, you, I'll go ahead and jump in, Reese, and you can uh, pick off of that. You know, I think, you know, there, there's different, I don't know, I think there's people that are, are neuro-curious, you know, and they're interested and they, they want to learn more, but either they don't know where to learn, or perhaps even they think it's too big, it's too complex, that they, they just kind of don't start. Um, then there's people that, you know, maybe are a little bit uh, neuroaverse, you know, and, and have some of the views that it is reductionistic, and we can't boil people down to single neurons and things like that. And, and you know, I think that goes along with what I was saying earlier in terms of we really look at the idea of the nervous system and the nervous um, and, and neuroscience in general is just opening up um, to possibilities, to other conceptualizations of our functioning that then we can say, where are my areas of intervention? Um, our friend Chad Luke gives a really nice um, analogy talking about cars. So Richard, since you mentioned the car, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and share that. And he says, you know, I don't need to know anything about my car to drive it, right? Um, but does knowing more about my car help me drive it differently, help me drive it better, help me take care of it, help me reap the benefits, the full benefits of what my car can bring me? So I think when we've talked with folks, you know, any of that initial reservation or hesitancy, um, when we start talking about it being more expansive, more exploratory, I think there's there's entry points there as we begin to start to work with people about how to do this, not haphazardly, but how to integrate neuroscience in a way that's practical, that's ethical, that's effective, and as accurate as possible. Um, as Richard, you said, everything's changing all the time. That's why I think we would propose everything as a theory to be unpacked and evaluated and critiqued. Mm -hmm. 
And just to jump on that last point, I know that I felt a sense of nervousness in writing this book because there was such a responsibility that if it was going to be published and shared widely with clinicians, like what if something in it wasn't accurate Um, or not just any longer, but, you know, we're often counselors working with translational neuroscience texts and we try to encourage um, the use and the look at primary text as much as possible, or the primary research as much as possible. Um, but you look at an average clinician that is maybe no longer connected to a university, you know, how much access do they really have to the primary science? You know, they're going to rely on these translational texts. And we wanted clinicians of that sort to also be contributors to the book because they're in the trenches mm-hmm. on the front lines every day. So we were a little nervous about that, but Eric and I talked about it. And I think the disclaimer is, is probably clearly articulated in the book, but worth noting here as well, is that if you are reading this book, you know, this is just the jumping off point for, mm-hmm. for any of the science that's in there, any of the activities that are in there. It's kind of like, take it, see if it makes sense to you at, as a clinician at the time before you use it, or even better, you know, I really like that Eric often says like, use that just to spark your own creativity. You know, they use the metaphor of a flower or the metaphor of a maze. What metaphors are important or relevant to your clients? What metaphors are relevant or knowledgeable to you based on, you know, your cultural background and the, those you work with. So really the text I hope is as accurate as we could possibly, you know, double check. Um, But readers should continue digging into the research they can find as best as possible and make any of their activities truly their own. Yeah. And look, guaranteed that our um, understanding of neuroscience, you know, changes uh, rapidly year by year. I think Louis Cozzolino said, uh, what was it, Richard, every five, 10 years or something, half of what oh, we know. <laughs> yes, well, well, yes, he said that one of the, half of what I learned uh, uh, is now not true. Yeah. And he said possibly half of what I'm telling you now isn't correct. I just don't know which half. Yeah, but that's not to say we're not to continue, you know, digging in and learning yeah. these things because, and mm-hmm. and um, as um, as Eric was saying, you know, this opens up this plane of possibility, mm-hmm. possibilities that we wouldn't have realised before without knowing the inner workings. And I just want to emphasize, you've, you've, you've been saying this, but to emphasize again to our listeners, this is a very practical um, book. This is about the application of the knowledge. It's not just about telling clients, labeling brain parts, you know, and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. It's very practical. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. Uh, sorry. No, I was just going to oh, say. Quickly, I was just going to say. Yeah, go ahead, jump in. No, I was, I was just just this lovely epigenetist that I, I'm thinking, Nessa Carey, and uh, she describes the, the need for description, explanation, and application, right. and that's a well-rounded piece, yeah. and uh, that's <laughs> what I think this book achieves. That was. Yeah. That's yeah, and I, and I think, thank you, Richard. And I was just going to say that, um, you know, we have a couple chapters that are more theoretical, right? And then it jumps into the meat of the book that is in each chapter, like, for example, one is like key principles of brain development or the embodied brain systems. We, Eric and I each contributed to the beginning part of those chapters, trying to pull out the most contemporary research we could and presenting it within a page or two, you know, maybe three pages at most. Um, And then the rest of the chapters are activity, activity, activity of different ways counselors, um, Mm -hmm. you know, tied to that chapter's theme integrate that information into sessions in in really different ways. But so there is that kind of mix of like, we tried to bring you the most contemporary conceptualizations of neuroscience around a particular area. And then, yeah, application, application, application. Okay, (laughs) wonderful. Yeah, so this this sort of um, movement, I mean, you, of course, the, the book is not all that, uh, you, you're not just two people sitting in, in books, you have quite a lot of activities. So you're, uh, you're centred at the University of Illinois, uh, if I'm correct? Uh, I'm at Northwestern University, and then Raysa is at, um, at Boise State University. Is it at Boise State? So across mm-hmm. university, Matt and I are between Sydney and Brisbane. Uh, uh, just the cities, but the, the so there's that work going on. But one thing that also has caught my mind is that you have a, a an ongoing um, online uh, project, the Brainstorm Live projects. Uh, now I've got to tell you, I really love this, but there's like for me in Australia, it's like three o'clock in the morning, so uh, I haven't caught up with you yet. But um, we've got a lot of listeners in in America and Europe. Uh, now this is an extension. It's it's the same philosophy as the as the neuroeducation toolbox. 
Yeah, you know, I think Race and I have been a part of a wonderful team and just collaborative folks in the counseling field specifically that have just been trying to answer this question of what does neuroscience mean to who we are and what we do? You know, and out of this has come a lot of gaps in terms of just like where do people access information? How do they distill information without diluting it to steal a phrase from some of our friends who wrote a neuro counseling textbook through the American Counseling Association? And, you know, part of that gap is just getting people together in community and reading articles together and talking about them. So Brainstorm began as a kind of a community that we offer continuing education credits, but that's really not the primary drive. Um, it's just people that, you know, we try to solicit some neuroscience researchers from across the world. We distribute an article ahead of time. We read the article. Hopefully we read the article, but if not, we invite that featured author in and then we talk with them about that article. We talk about their current neuroscience applications. And the interesting part for me is always learning about the personal development and how they interacted with neuroscience in the beginning and how it is for them now. And Richard, you were able to make it once at, I think, 3 a.m. for one of those shows. Oh, yes, yes, um, I, I did. I, once I was uh, enthusiastic, yeah. Yeah, because that's because I was on it. <laughs> yes, once he did, once he did get up that early. But you know, it's been fun. We've had, we've had every, we've had a lot of primary researchers, and then some uh, more translational approaches. You mentioned Louis Casalino; he's been there. Obviously, Richard's been there. Daniela Schiller visited us. We've just had a lot. Bruce Perry is another name that really stands out as a, a, a person that has spoke to me in a very special way about my development of becoming a neuroscience informed practitioner. So we build out our resources, we record them, they're all freely available on the website, www.webrainstorm.org. So um, check it out if y'all are interested in more recorded content, we share things um, as we can. Uh, so um, it's a great parallel with the work that you all do at the Science of Psychotherapy. And you'll also find a link to the Science of Psychotherapy in our networks page too. Wonderful. Well, everyone will find a link to yours on ours very shortly because we'll, we'll certainly because we have uh, a nice page for the podcast with lots of show notes and yeah. connections and opportunity for people to, to, to get in touch with, uh, with, with the book and everything else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rayson, what are you involved in um, apart from um, Brainstorm Network? Uh, other things that you're doing? Uh, well, you know, we're Eric mentioned a group that is of, of counselors. And so we're always up to something, you know, we have different research projects circulating and um, yeah, and, and a lot of teaching. So okay. I um, actually been spending my time lately learning how to teach courses online because our right. courses are all going online. Eric's already he's sailing through this crisis because he's, he's been uh, <laughs> teaching online, but I have not, I've always been a face to face. And as you know, maybe in Australia, I'm sure you don't really follow or care about us news, but oh, um, we're well, kind you... of not handling the whole coronavirus thing very well. What we and, find is um, we, we know it better than most Americans actually. Yeah, we're, but... <laughs> <laughs> we're very, in, we're very um, informed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it's having real implications on a higher education, certainly. I mean, all education, but so, but so that's kind of honestly has distracted me a bit as well as others. And so just trying to refocus and see how we're going to move forward with research. Eric and I are both really interested in taking this idea of neuroeducation and researching it um, more than just the anecdotal reports or even some of the qualitative work I've been involved in that has shown, you know, mm -hmm. I've done some qualitative work with school counselors learning neuroscience of adolescents and what that does for their role. And other clinicians with uh, Bonnie Badenoch's group, I've done some qualitative work looking at how that impacts their um, experience as a counselor and in their work with clients and, and with another group looking at neuroscience informed CBT, we've done some research. Um, but really, you know, digging down to what are the client outcomes that if a, if a counselor is delivering or exploring and using this idea of neuroeducation with clients, how does it impact client outcomes? And, you know, we just don't have a lot of empirical research around that yet. And so that would be something, you know, now that the book is published that um, is is a forward movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so terribly important, isn't it? We, I mean, we have conversations with people that, um, you know, they have things which the efficacy is there from, you know, their experience, but there just isn't the research behind it to mm -hmm. sort of legitimize it for 
the rest of psychotherapy world. So terribly important to get this research yeah. done. Well, I think so, because when you think that some of the most important uh, shifts and, and um, or, or springboards of, of uh, uh, learning that we've had, when you think uh, mirror neurons, uh, okay, it's 20 years, but even still it takes about 20 years for things to sink in. Uh, memory reconsolidation, you know, I mean, that's like mm -hmm. really new. We've been keeping in touch with Joseph Ledoux and, uh, you know, Richard Brown's new mm -hmm. work on on uh, consciousness and emotional representations. And and all these, uh, 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 as we were saying, the term I use is springboards. Not, knowledge is a springboard, mm -hmm. not a place to rigidify uh, mm -hmm. in. So these things, and I mean, uh, uh, it, it might be that that uh, every book that comes out is uh, has got more to come. But uh, uh, I think get, getting the 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 up to dateness that you guys have uh, at least invites us to keep looking uh, more exploratively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When you when you yeah. mention Richard, like memory reconsolidation, Brisek has been at that for, you know, 20 plus years and um, such a, a, a revolution in our understanding of, you know, how emotional memories are, uh, can be transformed. And yet, you know, we, we continually talking to people who have never heard of it, um, uh, don't understand mm -hmm. the process. And uh, so, yeah, these things uh, very, very slowly seep into um, sort of general practice, don't they? So we have to, we have to keep yeah. announcing, you know, what what yeah. some people you know have never never heard of before, and we we think, oh gosh, everyone should know about memory reconsolidation by now. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great well, point to think about. Go ahead, Brisa. Yes, and well, and I was just going to say I'm excited about this shift in the field and I'm sure neuroscientists are like oh we've you know this is not necessarily a new shift but certainly to us that are downstream a little bit of talking more about systems and right. um, not looking just at brain regions or parts and what a part does but really looking at the interacting you know connect domes and systems and yeah. what is that going to mean for the work we do and I'm really excited kind of personally to dig into this idea of the default mode network and the diffuse mode network idea. Um, because as you might imagine, as, as you all probably are, you don't really get to a place in your career academically or as a clinician and um, manager of, of like the psychotherapy, the science of psychotherapy without valuing productivity. Um, but learning, you know, understanding now the neuroscience of the diffuse mode, and the default mode, and this just what our brain does when we're not engaged in productive task oriented work and how valuable that is to brain health. And so, yeah, I mean, there's just like all these like little nuances of understanding neuroscience. And then what can that mean, um, not just for ourselves as professionals and our, um, you know, preventing secondary trauma or burnout, but also what we bring into the counseling, counseling room and how we frame interventions. So um, a, a journal as here in America just published a book recently called Do Nothing. And I bought it. And I'm, I'm slowly making my way through it because it's so like anti Western culture, you know, to value doing nothing. But because I understand the neuroscience or starting to understand the neuroscience around doing nothing, which isn't exactly doing nothing. It's just not doing right. Productive task oriented work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It makes me curious now. And I wasn't before I would never have looked at that before and thought what a waste of time, but oh, now it's I'm curious absol because absolutely. Because this is the thing of, of complexity, this idea of, of emergent aspects. Uh, I mean, I always talk to people uh, all the time. I say, you know, you have this fabulous conscious awareness, uh, like three times a day, you say to yourself, I'm hungry. Uh, and I say, and do you know what for? Uh, do you know, you know, like, is it B6? Is it folate? Is it, you know, two milligrams of, of vitamin C? You have no idea. Our consciousness only needs to know enough to make it move the body into doing something. Uh, so the less you do consciously, the more you're going to be able to potentially allow stuff to come through. And Carlos Castaneda was telling this back in the 70s. Uh, Don Juan was saying how to do nothing. And we all went, oh, take drugs. But no, uh, <laughs> take the brain and let it let the brain and the body function. It's uh, it's a, a beautiful thing. 
Yeah, yeah, and there's a whole field of um, understanding about having what I call white space and creativity as well to allow um, the, mm -hmm. the brain, especially the right hemisphere, in like that default mode to come up with creative ideas. Um, and you can't mm -hmm. be doing that when you're sort of on the treadmill continually in executive mode. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good example of how neuroscience maybe is just helping us see things that wisdom traditions have known for years to be true. Yeah. In new ways. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, guys, um, we're sort of coming to about to that time. Uh, it's oh great to catch up with you and to hear about your new book and your other resources, which we'll put no, uh, links in the show notes for everybody. Uh, any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Yes, Eric, I feel there's, 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 a, there's a statement sitting there waiting to get out that you've been <laughs> so polite and let us ramble. Did you have something oh, going yeah. on in your thoughts there? There's so much going on, and I think it comes back to the springboard concept, right? right? You know, this is the beginning, and it's just every time we have these dialogues, it just launches us into the next phase of inquiry. You know, and maybe that next phase of inquiry is just to rest for a little bit. Yeah. And in that resting comes that creative space that, that, Matt, you were talking about. So, you know, I always appreciate the dialogue and the opportunity to get together with folks. And for anybody that might be listening, you know, I hope to – hear from you uh tell us how you like the book or didn't like the book um and yeah just keep the conversation going because that's the important part keeping the dialogue going hey, andresa have you got a thought last something we we need to to take away i think eric's word Words of, of closing were sufficient and he, <laughs> he summed it up well we would love to hear from people who read the book to know um, what's resonating, what's not. And um, obviously looking again, just back to, we, we want to get some research around this area. So any potential collaborations um, or just advice, if you want to run something by one of us, I think we're both open to that. Yeah. That's the next stage of inquiry. What, uh, what, a, mm -hmm. what fascinating, amazing uh, things that we, we expect and things we don't expect sit just beyond what Ernie Rossi uh, calls uh, beyond the, 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 the edge, a creative edge, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Eric and Reza, thank you so much for joining us here on the science of psychotherapy podcast. We'll be watching you guys with great interest moving forward. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.